Doug Folsom's going to talk to us about winter walking. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, perfect time of year to bring up this subject because <clears throat> it hasn't quite happened yet. I see some snowflakes in the forecast out there, but we want to get ahead of this one because every year uh, we see some significant, very painful uh, injuries that happen with slips and falls on snow and ice. And so, and these are preventable. We can do things to keep these injuries from happening. If we plan ahead and if we take proper precautions and have the, the knowledge ahead of time, you know, have you ever slipped or fallen on snow or ice? I, I know I have uh, before, you know, that's something that uh, is pretty common. You've been walking around in the wintertime and there's snow out there and you, you've probably fallen down. And so what were the conditions? What happened? Uh, we've got a couple of polls here we want to run and kind of get your feedback and see what you've experienced. So if we can uh, launch these and take a look, we got this first one up here. Have you ever fallen down? You know, uh, obviously, I think we've probably all fallen down. Where were you when you fell down? Was it inside or outside? Uh, where, you know, were you when you fell down? Were you in like a parking lot, sidewalk? So take a look at those polls and answer those. Be thinking about slips and falls on snow and ice, you know, specifically as you answer those polls. And we'll just give you a few minutes to, to fill those out. And Jason, when it looks like we've got most of those responses in, let's kind of take a look and see what the experience is that our members have had out there. We have 59% not started. Not started. Come on, guys. Start clicking. Sounds like the, the election election tallies here. Actually, it sounds yeah, like we've got a few more seconds. We're doing a little better on that. Election numbers are up just a little bit. There we go. Okay, what does that look like? We got 50% uh, have participated. Have you ever fallen down? 41%. Um, let's see. Well, of those responding, 100% say yes, they have fallen down. Where so did you fall down? The majority, the vast majority of those, uh, 45 to 5, well, that's, sorry, I, <laughs> let me close the poll. <laughs> we'll make that work so that I can read it easier. Oh, it's not letting me search. It throws it up to let people finish. Hold on one second. The vast majority fell down outside. Okay. Um, where have you? Um, where were you? When you fell down. Um, parking lot, sidewalk are almost the same. Steps are almost the same. Zero percent in my office. Um, Jason's office. Well, anybody's <laughs> office. Your own office. Let's see. What was this one? I can't read it. Have you ever slipped and fallen on ice or ice or snow? 55%. Um, yeah, 100% said yes, they have. Wow. So basically, we know this is going to happen. What, what did that look like between parking lot, sidewalk, steps? It was almost e almost equal. Um, definitely, parking lot was the was the highest. 32, 27, 23 is how it, how it worked out. So I, I have to tell you, when we look at slip and falls that happen, you know, and where there's a work comp claim, it's really common. Parking lots is one of the big areas as you're getting out of the vehicle, walking across the parking lot. And of course, sidewalks are right up there, too. But we see an awful lot of these. So as we're talking about this today and as you're thinking ahead to preventing slip and falls this winter, I want you to really be thinking about your sidewalks and your parking lots and specifically when you're getting out of your vehicle, you know, when you're getting to work or when you're, you know, coming and going and getting in and out of your vehicle, because that's an area where we see a lot of these things happening. So this is what we want to do today. You know, we want to make sure that we kind of understand the risk. This is a high risk uh, area that we're talking about with the risk of falling on snow and ice in the wintertime. Obviously, when are we most at risk? I'll show you some numbers of what's happened in the past so we can understand that a little bit better. What can we do to actually prevent and prepare, you know, to not have these injuries or have these falls as we're going through the winter here? 
uh, you know, we show you this pie graph from every, every now and then that tells you of what is the cause of injuries that we have in our work comp claims. You know, strains is, is number one. You know, it's always like between number one and number two is strains and, and slip and falls. Uh, generally, we're looking at slip and falls being number two, but that's right up there. We see hundreds and hundreds of work comp claims every year from people having a slip and fall. And of course, the, the weather related, the snow and ice is a big contributor to these. Uh, when we're talking about falling down, it's something that will hurt you. About 17% of all uh, disabling occupational injuries result from a fall. And about 15% of all accidental deaths result from a fall as well. So this is dangerous. This is something that can really hurt you, however, because it seems like such a common event to deal with the cold weather and the snow and ice in the wintertime, I think we often take it for granted and we really need to be thinking about it. What kind of injuries are we going to have when we fall on, on ice? Well, a real common one is, is a tear of the rotator cuff. Uh, we'll kind of talk about how and why that happens, sprains and strains, but also if you, especially if you fall over backwards, fall flat on your back, you know, you can hit your back of your head. And so head and, and brain trauma could be some really serious injuries that can happen from slip and falls on ice, as well as, you know, fractures and bumps and bruises and so forth, which is probably what happens most of the time. But even though that's most of the time, there's really not a whole lot of difference in conditions between when I fall and maybe have a sprain or when I fall and hit my head and die. Uh, there is really hard to, to do any particular thing that, uh, you know, prevents one from the other. So we really need to treat all of these situations as a potential serious injury uh, when we're trying to avoid these slips and falls. You know, how do we, how do we, you know, deal with this? What causes a slip? Well, there's a lot of different conditions that we may be dealing with, whether it's watery, wet conditions, mud, lots of times it's other debris that can cause the, the surface under our feet to be more slippery, not be able to make good contact with the solid ground, whether that's, you know, leaves, it could be paper that's on a smooth piece of ground and you step on that paper and that paper slips out from under your foot, dirt, grease, oil, all these things can change the coefficient of friction between your foot and the ground. The big one though is the snow and especially the ice when we get these icy conditions. If we look at what's happened, I went back to 2017 and looked at all of our work comp claims in 2017, and I went through them and I picked out all the ones that had in the description a slip on ice. And I pulled those out and to compare, what do those look like? Well, in the month of January in 2017, 29% of all our work comp claims were from slipping on ice. And it actually resulted in well over half, 65%, of the cost of all the work comp claims we had in January that year were from slips on ice. So that is significant. If we can eliminate that one cause, if we can eliminate slipping on ice, uh, we, we get a big control, at least in that one month, on you know the, our work comp injuries and that pain and that suffering and that lost productivity and all the things that go along with it. But it's interesting when we look at this in February, we only had about 6% or 7% of our claims were slipping on ice. In March, it was only, it was less than 4%. If we go to the other end of the year, coming into the winter, we, in 2017, it was less than 2% that happened in November and about 2% in December, a little bit more in December. So why is January such a bad month? And I think to answer that question, we really have to look at what were the weather conditions like? So I went back and I looked up the weather conditions in Salt Lake City. So a lot of these incidents may have happened in Cache Valley or out in the basin or you know other places around the state where the weather may not have been same from day to day, but I could tell that the claims seemed to be the day of or the day after a snow accumulation. And so that pretty much makes sense. If we look at this in January of 2017, that's was the month that we had most days with snow accumulation. There were almost half of the days in January in 2017 had snow accumulation. And there was over 23 inches of accumulation in Salt Lake City in January. So if we compare that to February and March and December, the other months, it was significantly more. The weather was a lot worse in January. So obviously we had a lot more of these slip and falls. So if we wanna predict when potentially we may have a slip on ice, 
we need to look at the weather forecast. Is it going to snow today? Did it snow yesterday? Uh, so is it likely that there's going to be snow and ice on sidewalks, parking lots, and so forth? That's your big predictor is the weather. It also may be when we get the first big storms in the year, when we're not maybe prepared ourselves for the changing weather conditions, uh, maybe another indicator. But if we keep our eye on the weather forecast and pay attention, whether it snowed the day before or whether it's you know, likely to snow today and have those icy conditions exist during or afterwards, that's when we really need to make sure that we're preparing, you know, to prevent slips and falls. So what is, what is a slip? When we slip, it's when you have too little friction or traction between the bottom of your foot and the surface that you're walking on. And actually, we call that coefficient of friction, uh, which is the ratio between the force necessary to move one object horizontally across another surface or across another object. So that coefficient of friction is how easily two objects will slide over each other or how one object will slide over another. So some things will decrease the coefficient of friction more than others. And ice is probably one of the biggest ones. So how do we prevent? Well, basically, risk avoidance is our best form of risk management. If I can avoid the hazard altogether, that's the best thing to do. So if we got snow and ice outside and I stay inside, I'm not probably not going to slip and fall on the ice. However, that may not be an option every day. And so, you know, we also need to be prepared for when we do need to go outside. So let's talk about safe walking practices. What is proper footwear? It's kind of like a PPE for snow and ice, making sure that we can increase that coefficient of friction between our feet and the ground when we're walking. And if we do fall, understanding, you know, some basics about how to lessen the impact of a fall and how to prevent some of the more serious types of injuries that may occur when you fall down. Like I mentioned already, a lot of our claims for slip and falls happen in parking lots. And often we'll see the description is, you know, the, the employee is getting out of the truck or just got out of the vehicle. And often people, they just, they put their foot down on the ground, getting out of the vehicle, and they just slip and fall right there, right next to the vehicle. They're not anticipating that they're stepping out onto icy ground. And so it's very important to make sure if, you, if we've got bad or cold weather and there's moisture, that we're thinking about that possibility of having that icy surface before we step out of the vehicle. Another really important, especially with trucks and, and trucks that have high ground clearance, when we're dismounting, make sure we use that three points of contact. Use both hands and both feet as you're climbing down out of the vehicle. And when you get your feet on the ground, you know, keep two hands on a handhold just to make sure that you're stable and, and sturdy before you let go, especially if there's snow and ice outside. Be really careful dismounting your vehicles. But then walking across the parking lots and walking across the sidewalks are another area where we have a lot of problems. So make sure that we have a program in place for clearing that snow and ice in a timely manner. It's very important to always remember to document your snow and ice removal activities. You know, having a snow and ice removal log is important because if we do ever have to defend ourselves in a liability claim, we need to be able to demonstrate that we've been reasonable and prudent in our efforts to remove the snow and ice. And so make sure we document that, make sure we're doing it frequently as necessary and, and keeping track of our efforts there. If you've got employees who are arriving at work before the snow removal has been done, you know, then we need to think about what do we do for those employees to keep them safe as they enter and exit uh, the parking lot in our facilities. There are organizational solutions and there's individual solutions. As an organization, you can be addressing, you know, who's responsible for that snow and ice removal and how do we make sure, how do we try and get that person out there to take care of that snow and ice removal before others are arriving would be a, an important organizational solution there. Or if you have a service that does your snow and ice removal, you know, make that a part of your contract that if, you know, you had accumulation overnight that that snow removal needs to be done before a certain time, you know, before eight o'clock or seven o'clock or however early it needs to be uh, in order for your employees and, and, and people coming in your facilities to be able to enter and, and navigate those facilities safely. But then that maintenance may need to be done throughout the day if there's an active storm. Individual ways of approaching it could be 
you know, a big one is looking at your footwear. What are you putting between your feet and the ground to make sure we're increasing that coefficient of friction? And lots of times we put on our work boots and our work, work boots have, here we go, Jason, waffle stomper soles. <laughs> and we think that these, you know, knobs and these deep, you know, uh, cuts in between these knobs will help us get traction as we're walking in the snow and ice. And it may help when we're walking in soft snow and those types of conditions to get some traction. But if we're talking about icy conditions, even that, you know, heavy traction sole on the bottom of your boots really isn't going to do you any good because the coefficient of friction isn't going to change between that hard rubber and the ice, regardless of the shape of the rubber. And so we need to think about what is the right kind of, of footwear to have on and it's not always going to be your normal work boots so maybe it requires having a different pair of boots that are specifically for winter conditions that have a special sole on them or we may be thinking about having something that we can pull on over our boots and there's a lot of different options out there if you start looking at it there's all sorts of things we've got these pullovers that uh, have these studs in them and so those will dig into the ice just like the studs in a snow tire and those work great if you're out on ice, but if you walk inside onto the hardwood floor or onto the tile floor or something, you could easily scratch and damage the floor. So that's something to think about. If I'm gonna be outside the whole time, these will probably work fine for you. I've used uh, you know, things that I pull on over my shoes like this. They have an aluminum oxide strip you know, molded into the bottom. And that really does a great job of giving you traction on that ice. Maybe not as good as the studs, but it's pretty good. And if you happen to walk on, you know, a finished floor, you're less likely to do as much damage with, with this as with those studs. They also have some, you know, whether it's for just, th these would be something you might actually be able to have put on your boots permanently, or you can find some pullovers that are like this, but this is kind of like a snow tire where it has a really soft rubber with lots of sipes and material embedded in that soft rubber to help you get good traction out there on the ice. And, and this would probably do the least amount of damage if you were to happen to wear these inside on a finished floor as well. So you kind of have to look, am I outside the whole time? Am I coming in on the cement floors or or what, you know, those spikes may be slippery when you come in onto a smooth cement floor. So we really need to make sure we're selecting the proper personal protective equipment, you know, for our needs. How much time are we outside? Are we going inside and outside, making sure that we choose, make a selection that is gonna work best for us. But these things, these, these types of soles, putting them over your shoes can make a huge difference. In fact, I, I keep a couple of different types of these in my truck. And so when there's bad weather in the winter time, I can pull those on over whatever pair of shoes I'm wearing before I get out of the truck on a snowy or an icy day. And they really do help a ton. What are some other things that we can do to help us not slip and fall on the ice? Well, one thing to keep in mind is to move slowly and steady. You know, if we're pushing off hard to kind of speed up and walk faster, obviously you're gonna lose traction when you do that. And so you're much more likely to slip if you're trying to move faster or if you're trying to put your foot out there and plan it to slow down, then you're much more likely to slip when you do that as well. So if you just move slowly at a steady speed where you don't have to try and speed up or slow down, obviously you're less likely to slip and fall. Take shorter steps. If I can keep my feet as close to my center of gravity as possible with short little steps, then I'm much less likely to slip. Avoid areas where the ice looks like it may be starting to melt because water on top of ice is the slipperiest condition that you may encounter. So be looking at the surface and you know, is the surface changing? Is that ice maybe looking like it's wet ice? That's gonna be much slipperier, avoid that. Uh, avoid slopes, you know, if you're walking up a little hill or any kind of incline, and it's icy, you're, you're going to slip unless you've got something under your feet that will dig into that ice and grab a hold of it. Stairs are the same way, and that's kind of a scary place. You know, if you're walking upstairs, the steps should be level, which helps, but you don't want to slip on those stairs. So again, take those small steps, keep your foot flat, don't be pushing off your toe or your heel, and use a handrail, obviously, you know, to help keep yourself steady uh, if you have to go up icy steps. Try to avoid those slopes and, and icy stairs if you can. You know, wear the right kind of traction under your feet. And, you know, one thing they talk about a lot of times when you're looking for, uh, 
doing, uh, looking into how to not fall on the ice, as they say, walk like a penguin or waddle, which really basically just comes back to taking those teeny tiny little steps where you keep your feet flat and you go at a slow, steady speed where you're not stopping or pushing off to go faster. And that will help you get across those icy spots without falling down. But I really can't emphasize enough how important it is to Think about and be prepared with something to put on over your shoes or a different type of shoe to help you get that traction that you need. If you should fall, uh, when you slip and fall on ice, I found that you tend to go down a lot harder. When I slipped on ice, I felt like it was a much harder fall. When your feet just all of a sudden come out from under you, and it seems like you fall down pretty fast and pretty hard. If I trip on something and stumble a little bit, you know, I kind of maybe actual, I may be able to slow down my fall a little bit as I'm stumbling and, and catching myself and I don't hit the ground as hard. But when my feet just come out from under me and I go straight down on the ground, that's going to be a hard fall that may cause some serious injury. So one thing really important to remember is to keep your head up when you fall. You don't want to be hitting your head, especially the back of your head, but really anywhere on your head. You don't want to be hitting it on a step or on the hard ground because that can be a really serious permanent injury, maybe even a fatal injury falling and hitting your head. So try and if you're falling backwards, tuck your chin down and keep your, the back of your head away from the ground as you're going to fall. Another thing you can do if you're falling forward, hit the ground. Try to actually move your arms and slap the ground hard as you fall. That can slow you down and actually reduce the amount of shock to your body as you hit the ground. It's really important to try and keep your elbows bent you know, which is a good thing. If I put my arms out straight and lock my elbows when they hit the ground, that's going to transfer all that force right into my shoulders, which winds up being one of the most common types of injuries, which is a very serious injury tearing that rotator cuff. If I fall backwards, it's really important because it's really hard to put your arms behind you to catch you without having your elbows locked straight. So if you're falling backwards, you need to try and bend your arms or, or even maybe try to not put your hands back there to catch your fall, which is kind of counterintuitive. You want to try and break your fall, but, you know, that's a, that's a real common way we see those rotator cuffs is falling backwards and putting your arms straight behind you to try and break your fall. So what we want to try and do, number one, stay relaxed. If we're really tense, we're much more likely to have a more serious injury. So breathe out, breathe out normally as you're falling. Try to, try to not be, you know, tense up and fold yourself a little bit. If you can tuck and roll into that fall, get yourself closer to the ground, but, you know, by bending your knees and, and, and folding yourself up, you will be closer to the ground, you know, instead of falling from your full height, that will reduce that impact. And if I can land on one side or the other, if I can, you know, roll towards my left or my right hip, that's going to also help reduce that shock to my body than if I fall straight down on my tailbone or straight on my back where I'm much more likely to cause some serious injury to, to my spine or even to fall back and hit my head. You know, so those are important keys. It's kind of hard to practice that. Slipping and falling on ice is something that happens in, in a split second, but if you can remember to try and roll to one side, not lock your arms and breathe out normally, and try to break your fall without locking your arms straight, that can go a long ways to helping reduce the severity of injuries you may have should you actually have a fall. So just kind of in summary, remember gravity always is going to win. If you slip and go down, you know, you're going to be pulled to the ground and you're not going to have a whole lot of control over, you know, what happens once you've actually slipped. You can try and fall a little bit better, fall to one side or the other and fold yourself up and tuck and roll. Uh, but, uh, you know, gravity is going to win. Be aware of the problem areas. Be thinking ahead when the weather, into the weather forecast. You know, plan the footwear, you know, with the, with the weather forecast. And, and remember, it's not just today's weather forecast, but what happened yesterday, because there'll always be a lot of residual left over. You know, make sure we're addressing that uh, snow and ice removal. If we can avoid the risk by not having the snow and ice, that's going to be one of our best solutions. But be careful. Watch your step. Anytime it's below freezing, especially if there's been any kind of water around, we want to make sure that we're, we're taking these precautions and we're looking ahead. Sometimes it maybe there didn't, doesn't even need to be weather, especially with these early storms that happen in November. If we get to, you know, we're still in fall and, and 
people haven't turned off their automatic sprinklers yet, you may see a freezing night where someone's automatic sprinklers come on and they wet the sidewalk. And then all of a sudden you've got some black ice or some really hard to detect ice right there in your walking path and there may not even have been any weather. Uh, so anytime we have this cold weather, make sure we're looking out for this. This is very preventable if we take a few sticks right now, make sure we have the proper footwear, it's available to us and we use it when that weather's bad and be looking out and being aware of, of our surroundings to, to avoid those areas where that risk is going to be the greatest. So any questions? All right, folks, if you've got a question, go ahead and type those into, into the chat box or the Q&A box. And while we're waiting for those, I'll ask Doug a question. What's the, what's the one thing, you know, we always look for action out of training. What's the one thing participants could do today to reduce their risk of uh, slipping and falling as we go into this winter season? As an individual, I think one of the most important things you could do is to find yourself some of those, uh, you know, traction shoes or old overshoes that you can put on to help you be able to be prepared for those icy conditions. So if I'm just preparing myself, I'm going to make sure that I've got those in my car, I've got them in my truck where I can slip them on on bad weather days and make sure that I'm thinking about it so that I use those because they really do work really great. As an organization, you know, we should be making sure that we're prepared with our snow removal program, uh, making sure that our, either our contracts with snow removal companies or our employees that do the snow removal for us, that we've got a program and a plan in place to make sure that we're addressing the snow and ice hazards in a reasonable and prudent manner, and we're taking care of that as early as possible and as, as often as necessary. Great. Good response there. Good. Good stuff. That's exactly the direction I was going. Okay, here's a question. Is it better to use salt or snow melt? Well, you know, they, they both work. The snow melt, uh, you know, can work faster. Uh, and, you know, the salt's cheaper. Uh, so, you know, I, I think you're, you're good both ways. Once you got it on there, it starts to cut through. Even if it's not totally melted yet, you know, those granules of salt can help provide some traction. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the snow melt, you know, might work faster and dry the area out quicker. I don't know, Jason, do you have an opinion? Yeah, just the, just the salt can actually damage the concrete. Um, and so that's why we've gone more to the, more to the ice melt product that, that isn't quite as damaging to the, to the surface itself. Um, and, and there are a lot of different products out there. I, I think the most important thing is to use it. Um, you know, I would go with an ice melt product just because it's more designed that way. It gives a little bit of traction, and uh, and a lot of those are designed to actually penetrate down through the um, if there's some ice there and and loosen it up so it makes it easier for you to get out and shovel it off. So here's another uh, another question. We have uneven sidewalks surrounding our main parking lot. Would you recommend grinding them to level or pouring a, a top cap of concrete? Really, it depends on the extent of the damage, how far, you know, how big, how big it is. Are we talking a quarter of an inch, a half an inch? Or are we talking three or four inches? Uh, so cutting, grinding is, is a good solution. There's nothing wrong with it that will remove the trip hazard. Uh, and it can be done, you know, quickly and, and, and affordably. But if the, if the sidewalk, if this concrete is lifted too much, obviously, you know, you're going to need to repair and, and replace that cement. I, I think that as long as we're addressing the trip hazard, uh, that's the most important thing. Yeah, good good response there. Just one thing that, that, that popped into my head on that is sometimes, uh, sometimes we have routes, um, sidewalks and such around our, um, around our facilities that are great summertime routes. Maybe they're in a shaded area, they're a, they're a sloped sidewalk um, that are just not good routes in the in the winter time. They're really hard to keep uh, hard to keep open. If they're not absolutely necessary, maybe we close some of those off. You know, if it's a if it's a bad spot that we can't prevent uh, prevent that ice and snow from building up there, um, and there's another way around, let's close that route off um, and and prevent people from from going into those bad places. And just for from a personal standpoint. Think about that. Are there bad locations around your area where it's on, you know, the north side of the building or something where where it's shaded 
where where your chance of finding slippery conditions go way up and avoid those places or think about that as you go around during the day. And and another thing to think about is like here's the trust we have a north parking lot and a south parking lot and if you've got can make it a choice between whether you're going to park on the north side of a building or a south side of the building, you know, there's there's probably a better chance that throughout the day that that south side is going to melt before the north side. And so you may be safer choosing to, you know, if you can choose which way you're going to go to choose the south side. Yeah, great. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in. So we will wrap it up. Anything else to say, Doug? No, that's it. Let's just think ahead. Let's get prepared now and let's make sure we're, you know, committed to doing what we can to keep ourselves safer as we go through this winter season. And if we all think about it and get prepared now, uh, we can avoid those torn rotator cuffs and, and worse potentially. So, uh, and that's what it's all about. Let's save the pain and suffering and uh, keep ourselves, keep ourselves vertical. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We appreciate you signing in today. Go out and have a safe day.